A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Proverbs 17, 17. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to the fourth episode of Two Mamas and a Mustard Seed. I am one of your hosts, Kisa Holke. And I'm your other host, Renee Rethel. Renee, is this not the coolest? I mean, yeah. you and I are podcasting together virtually it's pretty cool and we've got like a video going on over on youtube hopefully so we're really high tech this time around i mean i love it we're getting after it folks can even see our faces so right get into it <laughs> focus of discussion has been mostly about injustice and of course it'll continue to be so mm-hmm. however we talked about pausing this week and talking about relationships and more specifically mm-hmm. how to genuinely build a relationship with someone of another ethnic background. That's right. I'm, I'm excited, Kisa. We wanted to focus on some practical action steps that people could start to implement implement no matter what race we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some, especially the extroverts of our audience, all of this that we're going to talk about might seem like no brainers. It might just be a re- refresher course, but for some like me, the introverts of the group, um, this is going to seem like a big task. So let's help our listening friends, extroverts, and especially introverts rise to the occasion with ways that we believe will help. Let's talk about four actionable steps that we can use to build ethnically diverse relationships. So first, examine your circle. Mm -hmm. Second, be intentional. Third, get uncomfortable. And fourth, do the work. Mm -hmm. So in in examining your circle, I believe that everyone should first look at their personal everyday circles and ask themselves, is it diverse? I mean, does my sphere of influence reflect multiple ethnic groups um, of any culture, uh, different different backgrounds, and, and if it doesn't, why not? That's right, exactly, why not? You know, Psychology Today in 2016 reported that three out of four white Americans had no non-white friends, zero. Three out of four. Wow. Um, why is that? The article refers to our patterns, you know, our daily routines. Do we do the same thing every day? Do we talk to the same people every day? Um, do we find ourselves in the same all white spaces or all black spaces for that matter every day? What if what would it look like if we broke out of those spaces and intentionally talked to people who were different than us? Right. Um, you know. I think that's where the deep richness of life comes from. That's where we see the beauty of God's creation. I think about my own life. It was kind of boring, I think, Mm -hmm. before I started to break out of my shell a little bit and fill it with people who are a lot different than I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say building off our first step, be intentional. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, intentionality is where... I mean, we have to start. It's not just going to happen by itself, right? We have to start with intentionality. Start to learn about other cultures and people so you're less likely to accept the narrative that you may hear on a news outlet or social media or even your neighbor, possibly. And we see that a lot um, in today's age. You know, everyone has an answer for something. So as you know, I recently um, started attending a Be the Bridge a reconciliation group here in Louisville, and it's yep. based on Latasha Morrison's book, Be the Bridge, <clears throat> by the same title, of course. And in our very first session, the discussion uh, on bridging truth and racial reconciliation had to do with awareness. Hmm. And so I would say that awareness looks a lot like intentionality, right? Yeah, it does. Well, you know, we have to be intentional to know what's around us we have to be intentional to pay attention right it all sounds kind of redundant but it's so true and it's hard to keep that in the forefront of our minds every especially 
in today's culture, we're busy and we're mm. juggling a thousand different things and um, seems like just one more thing, but um, it's worth it. It's worth it to branch out. It's worth it to get uncomfortable a little bit. Um, and I would say there's a couple of things we need to remember in this process. We need to remember that we need to be intentional about learning about cultural history, racial history. We need to watch shows with um, lead characters or protagonists that look different than us, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We need to maybe try different foods from different ethnic groups or listen to different music. And this one might be the hardest. Go to a different church Yeah. every now and then, just, just to see just to see. Um, We just need to be willing to uh, put ourselves in positions that allow us to get to know people who are different than us, right? Absolutely. And uncomfortable was the key word there, right? (laughs) It's uncomfortable to do something different. Yeah, Yeah, it is. We, as humans, we like our comforts. We like Mm -hmm. our, you know, our lazy boy recliners, (laughs) so to speak. We, we like the familiar familiarity we you know it's less threatening That's to amazing. us no right absolutely but doing this is is worth it building yeah. friendships and relationships is worth it yeah so absolutely get uncomfortable <laughs> yeah um so miss kisa you know of um miss ruby bridges right yeah mm. She had a birthday last week. She turned 66 years old. And for those of you who are unaware of who Miss Ruby Bridges is, she was the first black child to desegregate uh, the all white William France Elementary School in Louisiana. She was only six years old at the time when she um, bravely walked into her school. It was November 14th. 1960. When I read that she was only six, that blew my mind. My youngest right now is six. And that's, that's a lot of bravery to carry on a six-year-old little girl's shoulders, right? Oh, yeah. I think about her parents and the role they played in that, right, too. I, you know, she didn't just walk into that school all by herself. There were two adults behind her who made the choice, um, and said, you know, we want our child, we want our daughter to go to a better school. We want her to be at a school closer to home. The closest all black school is miles away from their home. Um, So they had to make that choice, right? Right, right. The bravery that they had at that time exposing their daughter to the experiences, the negative experiences she was gonna have and teaching her to be brave at six years old, is super it's it's powerful i mean how much richer is her life going to be or was her life with the experiences that she was going to have not only with education but i'm sure that some barriers were broken down with the kids that she was in school with at some point maybe not right away um yeah but just the experience the experience of learning about other cultures by being in that environment environment you know yeah. proximity is is key, you know, Yeah, just being in that environment. So, yeah, absolutely. And the proximity of her spaces, right. Her home space and her school space. So allowed for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I uh, just, I love that idea that proximity allowed for mm-hmm. her to be integrated. Yes. Um, but that's not always the case. And so the question is, are we now in 2020, are we in proximity of people mm-hmm. who are different than us? Mm-hmm. You know, I've been reading a book called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. And it's by Beverly Daniel Tatum. She's a PhD. She says, quote, racism is not your fault, but saying it's not your fault doesn't relieve you of the responsibility. We may not have polluted the air, but we need to take the responsibility along with others to clean it up. Each of us needs to look at our own behavior. Am I perpetuating and reinforcing the negative messages that are so pervasive in our culture? Or am I seeking to challenge them? If I have not been exposed to the positive messages of marginalized groups, am I seeking them out, expanding my own knowledge base for myself and for my children? Am I acknowledging and examining my own prejudices, 
my own rigid categorization of others, thereby minimizing the adverse impact that they have on my interactions with those I have categorized. We teach what we were taught. Mm. So powerful. So racism may not be taught, but it's still our responsibility to correct is what I, I gathered from that. Yeah. afraid of you, Julius. I only saw what I was afraid of. And I don't know, I was only hating my brother. <laughs> I tell you what, though. Um, when all this is over, and you gonna move out the same neighborhood together. Okay, and, um, <laughs> we'll get old, we mm -hmm. gonna get fat. And ain't gonna be all this black-white between us. Left side. Strong side. You just listened to a clip from the 2000 Disney Pictures movie, Remember the Titans. This clip featured actor Ryan Hurst playing Gary Battier and actor Wood Harris playing Julius Campbell. It's about a high school integrating. I think it was in Virginia is where the school was. Um, and it's based on a true story, right, Kisa? Yes. Yeah. I mm -hmm. thought so. Um, the movie focuses on the integration of the football team, though, um, to focus in. In this clip that we listened to, Gary and Julius shared a heartfelt, heartfelt moment reflective of their friendship. Um, football brought them together right. and put them in a situation where they had to get to know one another. Because right. if they didn't, coach would be all over them, right? All over them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this would fall under, this clip would fall under do the work. And what we want to illustrate here is how much richer our lives would be if we just opened ourselves up to those possibilities. Right. Once those guys spent time together, most of the preconceived notions and bias just melted away. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it takes me back to, again, Beverly Daniel Tatum's quote, we teach what we were taught. So this may be difficult for some folks because, you know, you don't ever want to think about your parents in a negative light. You don't ever want to think about them or your upbringing negatively or poorly. Your parents may have been loving. You may have felt the love, you know, all throughout your childhood. However, it's just going to be hard to come to grips with the fact that they may have passed down some racial biases that were passed down to them from, from their parents. Mm -hmm. And so shifting our paradigms can be very emotional because it's retraining your mind to see the world differently. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's definitely, but I, I think there's something really sweet though in that retraining of our minds because we learn to see the world the way that it was created. Mm -hmm right? The richness and the beauty of differences, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we're supposed to be in relationship with people who aren't yeah. mere images of ourselves. Absolutely. I think. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think that's the way God made it. In Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove's book, Reconstructing the Gospel, mm -hmm. Freedom from the Slaveholders' mm -hmm. Religion, he says this to white readers, the practice of constantly reforming our lives becomes essential for the healing of our hearts and places and the relationships we inhabit. No, we can't just do something and yet each of us must do something to respond faithfully to the people we've heard and the lament we've engaged in. So, I'm going to talk a little bit to my white brothers and sisters now. Um, you know, once we've learned some of this information of racial history in America, um, what do we do with it? Right? Where where do we go with it? Um, how are we reaching out once we've learned what we've learned? And how are we, you know, breaking down barriers? How are we intentionally loving people well, knowing what we know now? It's just, it's good questions. I can recall my parents and my upbringing being a really good, being a really good upbringing. 
Um, they taught they taught us not to be biased um, racially. However, as a person of color, they taught us how to navigate this world um, as such. So uh, they taught us truly to love all people. And I know that that was largely in part due to our Christian faith. But that said, they took us to conferences with white teachers uh, and they introduced us to friends of theirs that were um, culturally different as well. You know, we were always allowed and taught that you can love you can love someone of, a, of another ethnic background. You know, they've always been supportive of of that and been intentional about not showing bias, but loving all people. And so I'm very I'm very thankful for that. I love that so much, Kisa. Um I love that your parents did that. Not not all parents do that. And if because if they did, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today, right? Um, so I love that they did that. I, I know as a parent myself that it mm-hmm. takes hard work. And so I know how must in, how intentional they must have been yeah. Yeah. to do that. It's hard work. Yeah, it is. Um, so just the contrast with you, I grew up in a small a wonderful small town in Northeast Ohio, but it was mostly white um, growing up, even though back in the day, it was a stop mm-hmm. on the Underground Railroad and it's full of all kinds of history, which maybe someday I'll tell you about. It's pretty cool. Um, but when I was growing up, it was mostly white. And socio socioeconomically, it was much more diverse though. Um, my family was probably on the lower mm-hmm. end of that spectrum for sure. And that's all right. Um, I learned a lot from that. I am who I am today because of that upbringing, for sure. And my parents did a wonderful job with the resources they had, I felt like. Um, So, you know, growing up in that environment, though, I had maybe a couple of Black classmates in high school, and they weren't even in my grade. They were maybe a year older, year younger. I don't think we had any Black classmates in my grade. Um, I think there was maybe one Black man that went to my church growing up. So that was the extent of my experience. It wasn't, wasn't much, was it? (laughs) Um, But that wasn't, I don't think there was anything my parents could do about that. You know, we've talked a lot about proximity and I, you know, given our Mm. economic status and our lack of resources really seemed like, and then our proximity of people who looked different than us, I don't, I don't think there was anything they could do it's, it's about hard. it. There's not always an ideal situation, you know, and so many of our, our communities are still very segregated, you know, so what do, do with that? I mean, even today. Yeah. Yeah. And we can definitely talk more about that on another episode. There's a lot that we need to learn about segregated communities and why that is. Um, but, you know, I would say even though, especially in 2020. I I don't think there are a lot of excuses for not, you know, for not teaching your kids about diversity because I we have so many resources at our fingertips, right? Just, you know, if we have access yeah. to a phone with yeah. data or a Wi-Fi connection, right. it opens up a whole world no to us, right? So, Yeah, there's a lot we can do to overcome that lack of physical proximity to people who look different than us and help our kids learn to celebrate diversity. I can't wait to talk about all of those ideas. I mean, all of these ideas help us gain an appreciation for diversity and build relationships with people of all races and ethnicities. I had a wonderful opportunity of attending a performing arts high school. (laughs) Yes. It was a yes. lot like fame, you know, before you ask. <laughs> and yes. I know I'm showing my age with that. I don't know how many That's of our listeners awesome. remember fame, but there may or may not have been. <laughs> there may not have been some folks <laughs> doing some pirouettes in the hallway or singing or doing a monologue over here and just loved it all. So it was a super cool uh, environment to be in. But I do remember that um, we had busing. They had like a desegregation initiative during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, in the early 90s and um, (laughs) they would bus in and kids would take taxis you know in from the suburbs and I just think about the relationships that I've had that are just that were just so rich and so meaningful uh, to me as a result of that like a kid who may have been 
a goth kid I had a relationship with or, you know, someone who was, you know, a cellist or, you know, an actor or whatever. I mean, it was just super cool to be in that kind of environment. So we've said it a few times here, proximity matters. It's super important. Um, you know, the desegregation, you know, initiative was intentional, you know, in bringing us together. And, but when that happened, we realized all of the commonalities uh, that we had, you know, we just had to be together to notice them. All right, so Keith, let's take a, a couple of minutes as mom is here to encourage the other parents who might be listening in this journey toward racial it. reconciliation. So author and anti-racism scholar that we've talked about on this show before, Ibram X. Kendi, recently said in an NPR interview, it was just this summer, actually, um, from my understanding, when parents desire for their kids mm. to be not racist, they typically do not talk to their kids about race. They avoid conversations about race or even explaining the racial inequities and mm. dynamics in their community. As a result, typically, those kids are taught to be racist by society. Something. Hmm. I mean, sometimes yeah. parents, we say that we didn't explicitly teach, you know, Johnny or Susie to be a racist. But then the question becomes, did you teach them how not to? I mean, right. Were you intentional about teaching yes. them not to? I mean, that's the difference. Yeah, that's exactly the difference. I remember a few years ago. My oldest son was in middle school, and there was a situation, um, a white boy um, did something very racist in front of some of the black boys, and um, I ended up having a conversation with the mama of this white boy, and she was, you know, just apologizing to me over and over again. I don't know where he learned to do something like that, um, to say something like that. He certainly didn't learn it from his father and I, he, you know, wasn't us, um, you know, and so she just felt this need to apologize on behalf of her son because of my son's feelings, but she couldn't give me an explanation of where he learned it from. So I asked her, I said, did you ever teach him not to say those things? Or did you ever teach him that doing something like that wasn't okay? And she didn't, to my recollection, I don't responded in any way to that question. And so I, I left that conversation wondering, well, maybe I got her on that one. Not that that's what it's about, but maybe that struck something. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, we know parenting is, is hard enough as it is. I mean, you know, you got to teach your kids how to eat. You teach them how to do their homework, you know, how not to torture their dog or their sister, um, how to tie their shoes how to get dressed, then how to manage money, all of those things, yet you still have to teach them how not to be a racist. So how do we do that? That's the question. That is the question. First of all, that's a lot on the yeah. list of things we yeah. have to do. So we'll just go to sleep till they're 18 and hope they figure right? it out. <laughs> We must, first and foremost, we must yeah. talk to our kids about this stuff. We must. Um, and we have to start young. That NPR uh, article interview I referenced with Ibram X. Kendi a little while ago, it mentioned that there are studies that have currently been done or that have recently been done that have found kids can internalize racial bias between the ages mm -hmm. of two mm -hmm. and four. Our toddlers are walking yeah, around it, with this stuff. That reminds me of the Jane Elliott experiment from the 1950s and 60s, the blue-eyed, brown-eyed experiment that she did, you know, back in the day. And those kids were super yes. young. And it's heartbreaking to see some of those things happen because, you know, they don't value themselves or see themselves as beautiful at some time, you know, sometimes because of the way society has portrayed uh, different things. But that just kind of popped to mind because those kids were, were super young. In those experiments, that's that's the study with yeah. the dolls, right? One in the Where they look, but she did do one with oh. dolls. Yes, that's the one that I'm thinking of. Yeah. Okay, Anderson Cooper just redid that experiment. Oh. Experiment, I think, like four or five years ago. Not that long. I mean, it's been within the last decade, and the results were basically the same. 
as they were from the original study. We'll have to look that up yeah. and put it in the show notes, Kisa. Because it's, uh, it's fascinating uh, hmm. to read. Kisa, I've seen some super cute video of your little man doing something that's really awesome. <laughs> and I know he's, it's because of your doing and your leading. Can you tell us yes, what that absolutely. is, my friend? Um, so Urban Intellectuals sells these Black History cards. And so there's lots of, there's so many figures in Black American history um, that they have out there. Um, but I've been working with our little guy on eight of them. So from James Baldwin to Benjamin Banneker, he's able to tell you their names and kind of what they did. So if he says James Baldwin, you know, James Baldwin was a poet. And so, or Bob Marley was a singer or Shirley Chisholm ran for president. She was a politician. And so it's super cool to have those resources that certainly weren't around when I was uh, a young child and uh, wasn't taught in school. I mean, you know, we would have had to do the research, but it just wasn't easily accessible. So. It blows my mind because your little man is mm-hmm. going to be three next month. So he's doing this at two years old. (laughs) It sinks in and that it just becomes a part of, you know, he's learning, he's learning about all facets of, of, of history with, with people of color, everyone that contributed to our world uh, in positive ways. And so it's, I'm glad that we're able to teach him some of those things right now, you know, the black thing in America and the progress. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I was trying to keep crayons out of my two year olds. Well, he just recently, like in the last episode, he just drew on the wall. So. <laughs> you know. It, <laughs> okay, that makes me feel a little better. It's so it's so sweet though, you all. He this little man can, you know, tell you who Barack Obama is <laughs> and that, you know about Miss Shirley and it's it's just the sweetest thing. I love it. And I I personally think, you know, of course I have black children, but if I had white children, knowing what I know now, I think I would do that with them too. You know, we you know, we do like mm-hmm. presidents of the USA yeah. flashcards and of course those are all white men and that kind of thing. Um but I think I would do this too. It's important Absolutely. for them to get both. Absolutely. Both of it, 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 both of it. it Is both, both of it a up. phrase? that's not all right it's it's important for them at a young age all kids to have an appreciation of the important people of all races right yeah yeah I I love that Kisa kudos to you mama um we'll put the links to those flashcards in our show notes as well and we also have a long list of books that you can get for your kiddos and we'll those are all listed on our resources page on our website, but we'll put the link to that in our show notes as well. You joined a book club too recently. You joined it with your son. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. with our Sorry. six-year-old. We did. And it's really cool. Every couple of months, we get three new books in the mail um, and they feature people of color, not just black people, but you know, we've received books about Chinese laborers this last package we got a book about a child who lived in a Japanese internment camp um we just got a book too about Shirley Chisholm it, I mean it's just so neat and he our little guy he loves these books he loves them and he um you know the Shirley book he was so enthralled by it and he was like mom Aww. does she win does she win does she does she become president it was kind of a little bit of a heartbreak when we had to tell her that she didn't but it's just it's been such a great tool to teach him history of all and different I'm sure types you guys of are cultures. Able to dialogue kind of after that too about you know what you just read right yeah for sure it, you know we try to do it in an age-appropriate way but we'll talk about why there were Japanese internment camps and, you know, what we can do to make better choices than some of the people who landed us in that position did. So it's just, it's a neat, a neat way to open up the dialogue now for sure. Another thing that we can do like my parents did um, with me is allow our children to experience some diversity that's something we can start to do right away. Yeah, exactly. And right, sometimes we have to seek it out to you. That's intentionality comes in. Um, maybe we have to take our kiddos to 
cultural festival or an age appropriate museum. And of course, in this COVID era, we need to make sure we're following guidelines and doing it safely, of course, but it, it can you still know, be done. They have virtual Absolutely. tours uh, for the museums now online that you can do. And uh, that's a good way to introduce your kiddos to, um, to diverse groups and things uh, without having to fight the crowds or, or germs, you know, instead of a germ. <laughs> the yeah. yucky germs and little ones pulling their masks off and yeah. sticking crayons up their nose. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we can, uh, we can also, a cool thing to do right now during COVID is maybe order some takeout from an ethnic restaurant. You know, our family, of course, loves Ethiopian food, but maybe a Thai restaurant or a Nigerian restaurant or whatever you have near you. And as you're sharing the meal with your kiddos, maybe you can listen to music from that country or talk about, um, you know, their culture and some of the things that we can appreciate yes. about their culture. No, very good. So much we can do. There's so much we can do to inter introduce culture and ethno traditions to our kiddos right now. I mean, there's, there's so much information at our fingertips that we didn't have when we were younger. So, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, kind of a cool time to be alive. Yeah. Although a little frustrating. <laughs> Um, so anyway, most importantly, Kisa, I think what we need to be doing for our kiddos is modeling yeah. this lifestyle of anti-racism mm -hmm. and loving all people. You know, our kiddos yeah. need to see us doing it. Right. They need to see us reading books, they need to see us watching movies. That's they need right. to see us reaching out Indeed. to people who look different than us. Yeah. yeah. You know, white parents to our children need to see us being allies to the black community right now, especially with everything going on in our country. They need to see us. They need to yeah. hear us talking about it. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what does it look like to be an ally? And I'd love for you to be the one to elaborate on that. So some of the things are a little bit more difficult for me. You know, Kisa, you and I have talked about protesting and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And that's, that's a really difficult one for me. Um, just because of crowds and I, I, I really do tense up and I don't feel as free to, um, be fully myself and who I need to be for the black community in those types of circles. And I think that because that's it's okay. Not a fear. You're I not think... afraid in the sense of, okay. So it's, yes, no, that's, that's it's okay because you're not, no, this is yeah. like a claustrophobic, like, mm -hmm. Ooh, kind of, it has nothing to do with who's around me. It just has everything to do with me feeling yes. this way. If you're listening to us, you can't see me doing what I'm doing on video, which is right. pushing my hands together. Good. Just Good. That's how I feel. It's just my introvertedness, I think. But there's so many other things we can do. Um, I love that, you know, so many yeah. people are out there protesting and doing their thing that's a huge way to be an ally and you know some other ways are get on the phone daily if you can with your political representatives talk to them about some of these issues write to them some other things we can do you know my family's met with the mayor of our little town outside of louisville after after an incident happened here and you know we kind of held him accountable and said, Hey, listen, why aren't you doing racial bias training with your police officers? You know, those are some ways, some really actionable ways we can do it. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways. Um, especially talking to your kids about it. Talk, 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 yeah. and talk some more. Um, you know, cause one of the ways as adults that we need to be an ally is yeah. correcting people. I believe around our dinner dinner table in our circle of friends and if they say something that's racist we need to call them out on it so to our kiddos if this happens at school in front of your friends what are you going to do yeah, yeah. let's flesh that's that out playing and just yeah presenting them with different options is is super good because they need to be they need to be prepared they, they absolutely need to be prepared i think that's good Renee. that's good yeah yeah and be, be transparent with your kids too. You know, let them know that you possibly made mistakes in this arena and that it's been a learning process for you. Um, you know, maybe teach your kids that they have it in their grasp to 
you know, maybe turn the tide a little bit on this narrative in our nation. They have the power to do that. Power them in that way. And I think if we just, again, continue mm -hmm. to examine our circles, become more intentional with people, be okay with being uncomfortable, roll up our sleeves and do the work, we can make some real lasting progress. That's our hope, right? I want Jesus to walk with at the end of every episode of Two Mamas and a Mustard Seed, we tell a two-minute story about a hero of civil rights. Fannie Lou Hamer was an African-American activist who helped organize the 1964 Freedom Summer African-American Voter Registration Drive in Mississippi. Fannie was born Fannie Lou Townsend and was the youngest of 20 children, born in 1917. She began working in the cotton fields at six years old alongside her parents, who were sharecroppers in the Mississippi Delta area. Fanny dropped out of school around the age of 12 to work full time and help her family. She worked as a sharecropper even after her 1944 marriage to Perry Pap Hamer. She was no stranger to struggle. She, Pap, and their two adopted children continued to work hard just to get by, but they often went hungry. Fanny was physically unable to have children of her own. She was given a hysterectomy without her consent while undergoing surgery to remove a tumor. Fanny's life changed in 1962 when she attended a protest meeting held by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, where she and other African-American attendees were encouraged to register to vote. In August of the same year, she traveled with several others to the county courthouse in Indianola to register. The group was met with fierce opposition from local and state law enforcement. Unfortunately, Hamer and one other person were the only ones allowed to fill out an application. There was a high price to pay for such bravery. Fanny was fired and driven from the plantation she lived and worked on for nearly 20 years. This was all taken away just for registering to vote. These actions empowered Hamer to push forward and to help other African Americans get the right to vote. According to the New York Times, she said, they kicked me off the plantation, they set me free. It's the best thing that could happen. Now I can work for my people. After becoming a community organizer in 1962 for the SNCC, her life was dedicated to the fight for civil rights. She took the lead on voter registration drives and relief efforts, but her involvement in the civil rights movement put her in harm's way often. As an activist, Fanny was threatened, beaten, arrested, and shot at. In 1963, she and other activists were arrested and placed <clears throat> in the Winona, Mississippi jail. While there, she suffered permanent kidney damage because she was beaten so badly. In 1964, Hamer helped found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. This party was established in opposition to her state's all-white delegation to that year's Democratic Convention and announced her bid for Congress. Although she lost the Democratic primary, she brought the civil rights struggle in Mississippi to the attention of the entire nation during a televised session at the convention. Along with her focus on voter registration, Hamer set up organizations to increase business opportunities for minorities and to provide childcare and other family services. She helped establish the National Women's Political Caucus in 1971. Diagnosed with breast cancer in 1976, Fannie Hamer continued to fight for civil rights. She died on March 14, 1977, in a hospital in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep? with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Two Mamas and a Mustard Seed. Until the next time, remember to be humble, be kind, be a good listener and be courageous. Two Mamas in a Mustard Seed is written and produced by Kisa Holke and myself. 
Music is licensed, licensed through musicbed.com. Learn more about us and hear more episodes on Two Mamas and a Mustard Seed.com. Sunshine, stay.